Well, hello, Capital Beach Church Faith family. Good to be with you again in another episode of our podcast. I think we're at episode 12 now, which is pretty cool. Um, so sorry that we've been irregular with our podcasts. You know, like everything, you get fired up in the beginning. You're going to do the best thing that anyone's ever done. You get 10 episodes in, you're like, oh, I'm tired this week. <laughs> I don't think I have anything to say. So you've become, and of course, that time frame happened right on Easter, so it kind of got mixed up and whatnot. But uh, we're doing our best to stay consistent and stay on track with you all. And this week, lighthearted topic, not wanting to get into the abortion stuff, not wanting to talk about war in Ukraine, uh, not wanting to address the fact that a transgender athlete just won a surfing contest in Western Australia, which is very disappointing to me. I just, I don't get this logic of transgender athleticism, especially when it comes and is supported by the group of people wanting equal rights for women, and then they're going to allow transgender men to step into sports. I just, I don't, I don't, the illogic of that just makes me want me to bang my head against the table. But alas, I won't be talking about that, though I kind of just did, but I'm not going to talk about it. Uh, this podcast. But what I do want to talk a little bit about is um, one of my favorite chapters in Acts that we actually just went through in our Thursday evening gathering. And if you don't attend our Thursday evening gathering and have not been for some time, I'd encourage you to come check it out. We run it kind of like a conversation now. I don't think it records well online, although maybe it does. I haven't seen it, but it's definitely, you won't catch the same experience like being there. Uh, but essentially what we've been doing for, gosh, it's been 17 weeks now because we're at Acts 17. Each week we've been taking a chapter of Acts, we read it, we discuss it, and it's just, it's what the church should be. It's a conversation and it's not everyone listening to one guy standing on a stage. It's, uh, I do my best to help facilitate, uh, but it's a conversation around the book of Acts. So I'd encourage you to check it out. But that, alas, I'm not here to promote that either. What I want to talk a little bit about is our vision of what has been known as evangelism in our current cultural climate. The evangelical movement was a movement that really built itself on the idea of, I guess originally it kind of started as a bit of a separatist movement uh, in that it was kind of started around the idea of people pulling away from culture to protect and preserve the gospel. And then from that, they moved into an area of then doing their best to tell culture about Jesus. And it's kind of gotten convoluted um, over the years. And essentially it's partly because um, we started the evangelical church movement as a movement that was primarily based on the idea that we were condemning culture, meaning that we were just kind of looking at it saying, no, 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 this is bad, this is bad, this is bad, pull away, preserve the kingdom, the gospel, um, live in a safe atmosphere, a, se a separate from what culture is doing. And then we kind of moved away from that, and that was probably like, I don't know, 20s, 30s, 40s. Then we kind of moved away from that and started began in the 50s, this idea of like critiquing culture where we weren't condemning it, we we're just kind of criticizing it. Like, well, you know, some things here are good, some things there are bad, and maybe we can find the goodness of God in some things in culture, but not everything. And then kind of moving into like the late 70s, 80s, uh, maybe a bit of the early 90s, we kind of moved into not condemning or critiquing, but we began to copy culture. That's kind of where you saw the rise in America of like the Christian coffee shop and the Christian heavy metal bands like Striper and Mylon Lefevre and Broken Heart and uh, all these other Christian rap artists. And we just essentially copied culture. We tried to make Christian films and none of it was good at all. It was all horrible. And anyone that grew up in that era of like 80s Christianity were kind of scarred from it for the entirety of their lives. Um, except, you know, the, the one band Striper, their, their name Striper is kind of, was kind of cool. And I actually looked for a Striper t-shirt recently online. It thought it'd be cool to wear it. But uh, we essentially were just kind of copying culture is what we did. So like 20s, 30s, you know, you know, condemning it, 
20s, 30s, 40s, you know, then you move into like 50s, 60s, we're kind of critically thinking through it. And then like late 70s, 80s, we're now copying into 90s. And then we kind of made a big switch in the 90s, I'd say, around the idea of um, kind of my generation where we were just kind of like tired of all the separatist ideas of evangelical churches. And we started to deconstruct. We, I think we were deconstructing way before the people are deconstructing today. And in our deconstructing, we kind of came up with the idea of like culture's fine. It's okay. We just got to um, find a way to be relevant thing. Like our magazine came out called relevant at the time, um, amongst other things. And what ended up happening was in that turn, uh, we were no longer condemning culture, and we definitely weren't critiquing it. And surely, finally, we stopped copying it. But what we be, what we began doing was we began just consuming it. And so we began consuming it in my generation. I was I probably be on the tail end of that, the younger ones, because I kind of I teeter on Gen X millennial. It was more the Gen Xers that began to. Uh, in a sense, deconstruct and then begin to, to consume. And then in a push back to evangelicalism, what ended up happening was we raised our kids, which now many of those kids are now what would be Gen Z. We raised our kids kind of separate from Christian culture, fully rooted them into popular culture, consumed culture. And now the fallout that we're seeing is a generation that has no concept of really Christianity anymore. Uh, and what you're seeing even in the church is that you know, we use a term like saved by grace and we have a thinking of that as parents, but our teenage young adult kids have no concept of what that even means. Grace for what? Why do we need grace? I'm, you know, and so it's, it's changed dramatically. And with that, as an evangelical music movement, clearly our responses to culture had to do with how we were then evangelizing or which is what the term we get evangelion, which is the Greek term for the gospel, how we're communicating the story of Jesus essentially to culture. And so we eventually got to the point where we were consuming culture so much that we were no longer communicating the message of culture. We just we had hoped that culture would just see our love and our grace. And in seeing how we treated and loved people, that would be good enough. God would do the rest of the work or they would find out about something at some other point. And it's essentially what's happened is now we're living in this like degraded, concept of Christianity where it just kind of doesn't stand for anything, but stands for everything. And no one can say it's this or it's that. And um, it's just gotten completely convoluted with culture. And it's hard to decide where true Christianity and cultural Christianity, where there's no, there's like no line. It's just all kind of meshed and merged together. And it's just kind of created chaos. And it's the chaos that we're seeing in culture is the same chaos we're seeing in the world now. So the church is just as divided as the world is politically. The church is just as divided around um, uh, uh, specific ideas of what is good for humans and what is not good is for humans. Uh, the, the, the church in many ways is just, has become kind of a microcosm of what's all what's happening in culture. We've just, cause we've just succumbed to culture cause we're just consuming it all the time. And that's kind of got us, I think COVID showed us clear as day. Yeah. Like what is the church even anymore? You know? So where am I going with that? <laughs> when I'm reading Acts chapter 17 and it's specifically the story of Paul, when he hits the city of Thessalonica, it's just, Anytime I get brought to the story, it's always just staggering to me the accusation Paul gets when he tries to communicate the story of Jesus to the Jewish people. Paul and his strategy was going outside of Israel to the area of, to the Greek world, to Greece, where their people were primary Gentile. And he wanted to communicate the story of Jesus to Gentiles, but he needed to get a team of people together to do that. And so what he would do is he'd first go to this small synagogues and synagogues were basically the mobile way for Jews to worship that weren't close, that who weren't living close to the temple. So they planted this synagogue idea. It's kind of like the mobile temple idea, if you will. It started at the time of um, exile in Babylon, some 580 years before Christ. And this same mobile model of what the, of community away from the temple stuck in Judaism. And now these Jews who were not living in Israel, but in the areas of Greece had these gathering spots. And essentially it's kind of where we get the idea from a church gathering from. And what Paul would do is when he would go to these cities outside of 
Israel to find people to work with. He'd go to the synagogue, express to the Jews, hey, the Messiah came. I don't know if he knew. This is what he did. He'd do his best to communicate to them that Jesus was actually the Messiah. Typically, the Jews would be like, uh, no, he's not. You're a liar. We don't want to hear this anymore. They would chase him out. But as he was leaving, there was a group of people in every synagogue known as god fears. God fears were people that weren't Jewish but had an attraction to the God of the Jews, didn't want to get circumcised to fully join the faith, but still feared God. And the Jews allowed them to be a part of the synagogue worship, though they weren't fully converted yet. So these guys were Gentiles, typically Greeks, non Jews, listening to Paul when he'd come to their synagogue and begin to hear the story of Jesus and go, wow, that's profound. I want to follow that guy out of this out of the synagogue and hear more about what he does. And this is where Paul kind of began to build his community for reaching the city. And typically these God fears oftentimes were influential people in the city. And the reason why they didn't want to get circumcised is because they didn't want to lose their reputation in the city by doing something to their physical bodies that might put them in the category or echo chamber of Judaism. So they would just fellowship as God fears, not convert fully to Judaism. And when Paul would come through, these people would follow him out the door and go, hey, you know, we work in the Agora, which is a central marketplace, or where we work in this business or in this area of policy making within the Roman government. We want to hear more what, about what you're saying. And then so Paul would communicate the story of the Messiah from the Jews for the Gentiles in those settings. What's fascinating is while he is doing that in the city of Thessalonica, when he rolls in, the Jews get so angry at him because he's essentially telling them that the Jewish people killed the Messiah that they were waiting for, and they don't believe the Messiah actually came. They're so angry at him that their accusation of Paul is just fascinating. Luke records it, depending on the translation you read in your Bible. I like the end of the way the NIV, NIV puts it, is he records it as the Jews accused Paul and Silas of flipping the world upside down because they had an allegiance to a different king and that king they called was Jesus. And that always strikes me because it would appear to be that Paul's vision of who Jesus was and how he was to affect the Christian's life was so staggering that a community with Christians in it would be the only way they could mark or determine what they were doing was to say that they were literally turning the city upside down simply by what they believed because it was so shocking and so life-changing. And that just, in my mind, kind of bursts any idea of what we've learned in the West as evangelism to any degree at all. Because when I think of... America and people evangelizing, I can rarely think of stories where people have said, wow, these Christians came and they turned our city upside down. And so it's always a challenge to me. Now, I'm not trying to say that that should be us. I just think it's a challenge to me that first, Paul was known as someone whose allegiance wasn't to a political leader that was a man. His allegiance was named that it was not to a political leader that was of this earth. It was to a political leader that was God. So that's always fascinating to me to kind of flush that one through for those of us that, you know, feel that God and country are tied together. I'm not trying to come against that. All I'm saying is it would appear the kingdom of God transcends all political parties so much so that they had to identify that, that that was the accusation against Paul. We're going to call Caesar because you're actually not loyal to a man who's in political power. You're loyal to this Jesus and you claim him as your king, that they would verbally say that. So that was staggering. And then that the impact was so great that it said that he's flipping the city upside down. Now, what I think Luke is putting that in there for is because what I think that they were doing is they weren't flipping the city upside down. In my mind, they're flipping the city right side up. And that's more than just evangelism. Because evangelism is the idea of, hey, you need to know Jesus. Do you know he died for your sins? You should accept him into your life. Let's do this private prayer. Do you accept him in your life? Yes, good, amen. Okay, go and sin no more and you don't have to go to hell. That's kind of like what we think of evangelism. But it, and it always comes across as this one-on-one private thing. But it would appear to be that Paul's 
sharing of the good news was so staggering that it was altering city affairs, that it was public, that it was in the marketplace, that it wasn't behind synagogue doors or any kind of church doors they created. It was out there in front of people and Paul was comfortable, yes, loving people, yes, caring for people, being kind, showing the fruits of the spirit, concerned with all that stuff as being demonstrative of the kingdom to people. But it would appear that Paul was also comfortable speaking boldly and saying, you need Jesus. That's all I can, that's all I can tell you. Like now that you know that God exists because of what I've told you, now that you know that Jesus was who he was, you have a choice. And this message was so life altering to people. It was upsetting their commerce. It was upsetting their politics. It was upsetting, you know, their worship, definitely for the Jews. Uh, We know that it was radically affecting the worship of the Gentiles. I mean, after all, he goes to Ephesus, preaches the gospel. The city rises up against them because they felt he was threatening their God Artemis. And the city drags him at the center Coliseum, like one of the most Ephesus was like the city of New York. I mean, when was the last time you saw the city of New York drag a preacher into Madison, into the center of Madison Square Garden I mean, and accuse him of messing with their commerce? Like, I mean, this it's kind of crazy. Now, of course, we have bigger cities today, and those cities were smaller. And yes, it was it was it was more rural in some respects, so people didn't have as much to do, and so they paid more attention. And yes, they were more spiritual. Like, I get all that, but at the end of the day, it would appear to be that the faith. The communication of the gospel was so public, the only terminology they could put behind it was it was messing everything up. So that challenges me because does my faith turn even my non-Christian friend's lives upside down? Let's just forget the city. (laughs) Let's step back from the suburb. Let's, let's not even talk about the neighborhood. Do I communicate my faith in such a way that people would look at me and go, man, you're turning everything upside down for me? Or what I would say is right side up. How often do I get trapped in the idea that, of course, I need to demonstrate the kingdom to people by being generous, demonstrate the kingdom to people by being kind, Demonstrate to people, demonstrate the kingdom by, to people by having a good work ethic, stepping into culture. Demonstrate the kingdom to people by um, striving to work with integrity and to create beauty and to show goodness in everything I do, to work with virtue, of course. But it would appear to be to Paul, that wasn't enough. Like there was a point for Paul where like, that was all good, but then are you using your voice Do people around you clearly know that you do those things because you want people to know Jesus or do we stop there every time? And I would say for me, I stop there a lot. It's convicting as 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 a mother giving me a spanking, but I would say that I probably stop there a lot where I have my friends that don't believe in Jesus and I love them and care for them. But if I was Paul, if I really loved them and cared for them, I'd probably be way more active in bringing Jesus to them so he could flip their life. They might feel like it's upside down, but that he could flip their life right side up. Why am I saying this? I think we're mentoring a season. I can't speak for the nation. Let me just speak for our little area. We're entering a dramatically post-Christian season in our culture. Now, what's tough about post-Christian seasons is that a post-Christian season indicates that the area you're in already had Christianity and now are rejecting it. That is way different than stepping into maybe a Hindu culture that is, um, in the sense, had no conversion, never heard the gospel, and you're stepping in there They're identifying things in their culture and saying, hey, you worship these different gods. Let me tell you about the true God. Then they hear it. God moves in their heart because they're open to it. And man, they're like, we want this. That's 
much different than a culture that's saying, hey, we've been there, we've done that, and now have decided we don't want that. And so now we're in a situation where it's no longer going to be like, let me show you the kingdom. It has to be showing, but then we have to become people that can walk into a setting like Paul walked in the synagogue and have a reasonable dialogue to explain why we believe what we believe and why we think it's important for them to believe more than just saying, Jesus loves you. And definitely not by just consuming all the same cultural stuff that's going on. So we're in this position in our current culture where we're, I think more than ever, we need to not run from culture, but we definitely need to stop consuming culture's ideas for us about anything, (laughs) meaning, purpose, sexuality, gender. Culture shouldn't determine that for us. We should take the time to understand what we believe from God's word. But then with that, while we should demonstrate the kingdom to people around us, we should also be able to, I think, in some level, intellectually explain beyond, I just felt like I needed Jesus. We need to be able to explain beyond the reason for the need to believe in something greater than ourselves. Now, at that point, if people reject it, or like Paul in Thessalonica, chase him out of the city, then we we have to experience that. But I don't think we are in a season where we can sit by, assume someone else is doing it, or sit by and think it's good enough that we just live graciousness and kindness, or definitely sit by and just be quiet and consume it. I think we need to find a balance of what the scripture calls being in the world, but not of it. And what I think that that at the core means that we work in the world, but the world doesn't determine for us what we're working towards. We already know what the world needs to be. So we step into the world and go, this is not how it ought to be because God didn't design it to be that way. So I'm going to step in and work tenaciously in healthcare, in media, in business. I'm going to work tirelessly to put it the way it ought to be because God's called me to care for creation. So I'm going to do that. But while I do that, I'm also going to reasonably and rationally communicate why I'm doing it. And so I think we've forgotten the importance of words. I mean, after all, we're speaking beings. We connect through words, through the sounds that come out of our mouth. And that's because we're made in the image of God. And if you think about it, God created everything by what? Speaking. So if we believe that we're made in the image of God, then I don't think we can hold back our voice for fear of being misunderstood or being judged. So instead, we step forward in loving kindness and show it. Yes, we need to show it, but I think in this season, we also need to become good communicators of it as well. So what does that mean? Well, I think it means we got to step back as Christians and really dial down what we believe and why we believe it. Because I think we're in the season where we need to be the people of the gospel, but also be able to adequately communicate the gospel to people around us and take the steps of boldness when appropriate, but nevertheless steps of boldness, because it's going to take boldness to do so, to just say, hey, friend, this chaos in your life that you keep texting me about, we need to sit and talk because you don't need to be experiencing this. Let me help you put your life right side up. Let me talk to you about a king that you can be allegiant, have allegiance to that's not bearing on any political power. And let me help you see your life the way it ought to be, not in the chaos of what the world's telling you to be. Wow, I didn't think I had anything to say, and I just went 24 minutes. So <clears throat> how do I close? I don't know. I don't know. This is what I'm thinking about right now. But <clears throat> I hope that we as a church could be people that think this stuff through well so we can be people, at least in our given area, that do our best to live the gospel and reasonably communicate the gospel and do so even at risk of our reputation because we're consumed with things, we're consumed with things being the way they ought to be 
and doing our best to maybe for some flip the world upside down, but doing our best to flip the world right side up. All right, that is it. Thank you, Capital Beach Church Faith family. And hopefully you were able to follow my random thoughts on where we're at today and the role we should play in communicating the gospel to people around you. Like always, please email, write in, let me know thoughts, feelings, or further things you'd like me to talk about as we continue to pursue this podcast. Bless you, Cabo Beach Church, Faith Family. See you, hopefully, this weekend.